Good evening, guys. Good to be with you. Um, as I was preparing for this message, uh, my prayer for you was that, Lord, I ask for the most, someone who feels most disqualified in this room, someone who feels weary, um, that you would give them divine courage. I just kept feeling that prayer of Ephesians where Paul says, May God give you spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him. And as you behold him rightly, that your eyes will be enlightened to know the hope of his calling in your life. I'm asking God for the grace that lay hold of Dave Slyker, Matt Candler, and Dana, and the rest of the leadership team in this house. The grace of God that sustained them. I was just Actually, I was praying this prayer, and Jacob Pilch came to me and actually prayed the prayer that I was praying. I was actually praying. Yeah, go for it, Jacob. I was praying. It just came to me. I was praying Psalm 132. In Psalm 132, I'm not going to break this down, but I just want you to go and pray this for yourself. Psalm 132 is, if I have to pick one passage that kept me here, until the third year of IHOPU, I had no vision for the prayer room. I did had, I'm not a musician. I'm not a singer. At least my wife tells me that I'm not. <laughs> so I'm in the very same category with Samuel Clow and Corey Russell and Mike Bickle. Where about, I, I, I claim that I'm probably the better singer of the four in that section. But <laughs> pretty good, right? Um, but uh, third, uh, uh, up to the third year of IHOPU, I had no vision for house of prayer. I mean, I'm a, I was born and raised in a context where my father prayed ten, seven hours a day in tongues. Go to the missions field. He's been going to Indonesia for 20 plus years, preaching the gospel, preparing the way. And, you know, having a name of Elijah, I just didn't really click or connect with the Mary of Bethany idea. I didn't really see myself, what am I going to do in an ugly chair, in an ugly room? For the rest of what? Like, what am I going to do? There are so many, so many anointed singers, musicians, and speakers. And I remember as a student, English was my second language. So third year of IHOPU, I didn't yet know how to pray in English at the time. So I remember, I remember during that time is when Mike preached a message out of Psalm 132. And that was the first time he preached in my student years. And he preached Psalm 132 is a vow that David makes in his teenage year. It says in verse 6, we've heard of the Ark of the Covenant in Ephrathah, in Bethlehem. So he hears this story about the Ark of God and the outbreaking of the Holy Spirit. And he makes a vow. He doesn't make uh, a commitment. He makes a vow, solemn vow. It's almost outrageous what he says. And my prayer for you, I'm, I'm, I'm asking the Lord, Lord, would you mark this student body in such a way, not because of what I'm about to share, but, but in this season, think about it. When Mike, before Mike met Bob Jones in 1979, Bob, this prophetic guy named Bob Jones had an encounter with the Lord where he stands on, this, on, on the beach and he sees all these treasure boxes. And as, the Lord, as he sees, you know, different men and women of God throughout history, George Whitfield, Charles Finney, you know, David Brainer, Jonathan Edwards, and it, as he watches these men and women open their treasure box, it was empty. And the Lord tells Bob Jones, open your treasure box. And Bob says, Lord, all of these men, it was empty. Like, these are men and women of God. And the Lord says, no, open your box. And as he opens the box, he says, draft notice. You have been drafted into the army of God. And the Lord prophesies to Bob Jones, I have preserved the best of the bloodline for the last generation. Now, if that's true, if that's true, and if God accomplished in a small measure, but if he has done all that he has spoken in 1982, 1983, and beyond, and if that word, he has preserved the best of the bloodlines for the last, that means this student body needs to have the exceeding power of grace like no other student body. No, the grace of God that is available for your student body needs to surpass Dana Kendler, 
Dave Slacker in the early IHOP days. Don't look at the early IHOP days as glory days. They prepared the way so that you can continue and go beyond. So my prayer for you is that, Lord, the outrageous vows that they made 24 years ago that sustained them, Lord, would you give us the courage to make the same commitment that only the grace of God can accomplish? See, Psalm 132, David makes such a commitment. He says, I will not rest. I will not go into my chamber. I will not allow my eyes to put to sleep until I find the resting place for God, the God of Jacob. On this genera- in this generation, in this region, in, our t- in my time frame, see, it wasn't, David was not supposed to unveil the Ark of the Covenant. But when he, you know, you can tell that Psalm 2, Psalm 110, we'll go talk to Matt Candler if, it's, if, if, if what I'm about to say is true. But when you look at Psalms, it seems to me it's real clear he was cut up into Revelation 4 reality. It's crystal clear. But when he saw the, the willingness of the seraphims and the 24 elders, an uncontainable wonder in their heart as they beheld, as they beheld the one who sits on the throne like sardius and emerald, and as they could not contain that awe and sense of wonder, David, as he beheld that reality, said, I don't care. I'm not going to wait for Messiah for that reality to to be on earth. I'm going to pull that reality. I'm going to do whatever it takes for that reality to be present, to be a present reality in my time frame. So my, my prayer for you is that God will give you grace and courage. Don't look at where you are right now. But I want you to remember the words and the promises and the Lord's beauty narrative over your life. So the title of this tonight, uh, tonight's message uh, seems heavy, but I just want to remind you that I'm coming with a sense of hope and an encouragement. I titled this message, The Great Tribulation for Lovesickness. Uh, over the past couple of weeks and months, it seems to me that the Lord's been emphasizing the reality of persecution a lot, uh, more than usual. The reality of persecution, especially as Mike and Stuart's been preaching through John 16. Uh, the Lord is really reminding us, we've already said yes to this, but I feel like the Lord is reminding us once again that persecution is not an option. I'm about to read you a quote by a prominent pastor named John Piper. But we, we like, I'm thinking about my generation that, you know, growing up in Korea, with all the comfort and luxury and just sense of security, the reality of North Korea, you know, think about it. My grandfather, he left North Korea before the Korean War. So I'm probably half North Korean. I mean, there's no such thing as half North or half South. We're all full Koreans. But my background is North Korean because my grandfather left North Korea, and then when war broke out, he began to, you know, had to war against his own nation or people group. But, the re- you know, when I hear stories about prison camp 42 where children are being born inside the prison camps, I don't relate to that. I mean, I can't relate. To be, to be frank, I can't relate to that. But as, as the Lord's been stirring our community about this reality, the persecution, it says in Philippians 1, Paul says, you have not only been called to believe in Jesus, but you have been called to, per- to be persecuted for his name's sake. If, if, if these words are true, if they're not exaggerated, and if it really does apply to our generation and perhaps our children, then we need something more than just knowing that this is coming. The, just the certainty of persecution is not enough. And the reason I say that is because Satan and demons even believe that this is coming. See, when Jesus came in Mark 8, and as he came, demons looked at him and said, Oh, son of God, have you come? Listen to their words. There's nothing theologically wrong about their confession. They have no problem in their doctrine. But not only that, they not only know who Jesus is and can able to say and tremble and honor and pray, they pray to him. They said, Oh, son of God. Have you come and it torment us before the time? 
They know the time. They know Daniel chapter 9. They know 490 years. They know the final three and a half years. Read Revelation 12. When the, the accuser of the brethren is casted down to the earth, it says, Woe to those who live on the earth, for the devil knew and knows his time is short. See, if anyone would do the 150 chapters of the end times, demons would do really well. The point of me saying that is I want to remind us you're, we are already in agreement with this. You did not come here. God did not bring you here or lure you here. And for you I have, uh, online students, wherever you are, God did not lead you to this place so you can have our information that demons agree. So that you can have a theology and doctrine that demons can confess. That's not why we are here. That's not what it means to be a forerunner. We need something way beyond than demonic doctrine. Way beyond than demonic end time knowledge. Demons agree that there is a set time. And they actively engage because there's a set time. And I'm asking God, Lord, I want something way beyond than just knowing and having the right information. And having the right quotations. I want the reality of not only that persecution is coming. What is it onto? What is it for? What's the purpose? So here it is. I'm still, on, I'm still with premise. This is my premise. But I promise you, the sermon is not going to be long. It's already past my bedtime. <laughs> so I want you to listen to this carefully. This is some, it's Pastor John Piper wrote this a number of years ago. But it's real, it's, it is relevant for our time right now. It seems to me that Christians in the West are being cuddled. We suffer little in the name of Christ. Therefore, we read the Bible not with a desperate hunger for evidences of God's triumph in pain, but with a view to improving our private pleasures. It's true. We do, but, but just to remind us again, the Lord did not bring all of you to I help you so you can learn inductive Bible study and exegesis to improve your private pleasures to have a bigger platform of ministry so this is why I'm so grateful about this leadership is that they have example the same leaders the same professors over you guys were my professors so these people are really old <laughs> I'm young I'm, I'm in your category but, but these men and women have exemplified for decades, I watched them, of fighting for the reality of lovesickness in their life. I mean, I, and, 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 and so the point of me reminding you of that, ask yourself again. Ask the Lord to remind you again why you're here. The point is not to do four years or two years or you graduated or you got good. I had the worst grade possible during IHOPU season. I mean, who gets C minus in IHOPU? That you just, you're, you're highly uneducated if you do that. I mean, if you're, if you're that person, I want to encourage you. One of these days, you can be transformed, you know. But coming back to my premise, we have been trained, I'm talking in, in the Western culture, including, you know, Asia, we've been trained to read the Bible to improve our private pleasures. Therefore, we read the Bible selectively. We pick a text here and there to fit our felt needs and the demand of Gen Z. And when you get invited to Gen Z conference, what are the texts that you pick? Now listen to this. This is like a doctor who forgets how to write prescriptions for the best antibiotics. Because everybody seems healthy. Everybody seems energetic. Everybody seems excited. So they forget how to write prescriptions for pandemic. And he has spent the last decades... Tweaking good health with hip-hop exercise videos. Unaware that pestilence is at the door. But the times are changing. 
Only a strange providence keeps our churches from being bombed. Only a strange providence is keeping Grandview not being the reality of Iran. So don't think it's strange that our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan is under the threat of Taliban. Think it's strange that you're not. That's what's strange. According to Jesus and the prophets. What's strange is that our reality is not the reality of North Korea. But the times are changing. It is only a matter of time till the reality of the rest of the world comes home. The cuddled Western world will sooner or later give away to great affliction. Global cataclysms and personal catastrophes are coming. I say this not as one with my finger in the wind, but in my finger in the Bible. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And when it does, whose vision of God would hold? Where are Christians being prepared? Where is Gen Z conference being prepared for great global sorrows? Where is the Christian mind and soul being prepared for the horrors to come? And not only the horrors, but the glory to come. And the revival and the breakthrough to come. What we need is to know the great things about God. And knowing the great things about God will help make us ready not to collapse under cataclysmic conflict and personal catastrophe. Where is the Christian mind being prepared for the horrors and the cataclysmic tribulation to come? I believe I help you exist to answer the dilemma. This is why you're here. The Lord has sent, sovereignly plucked you out of wherever you are, allured you into this place. Whether that's six months or that's for four years, the Lord is preparing you. The Lord has prepared Dave, Dana, Matt, and Jacob, Nathan, all these guys, this, this, this leadership, so that he would produce Christian mind. Those who will build upon the rock when the flood of persecution and the rain comes, that you will never be shaken. And that you will follow the Lamb wherever He goes and love Him even unto death. And I don't say this with a person who have endured persecution, but I say this with my finger in the Bible. Lord, if you say so, if you say you will build your church, Lord, give us grace for it. So I want to talk about the, the, the great tribulation for, when I say for, I want you to pay attention to the prepositional word for. What I mean by that is unto. Great tribulation unto lovesickness. These are not two separate ideas, two not separate realities. God actually orchestrates great tribulation so that he has a fruit in mind that he wants to bear. The idea is like a contraction. Three weeks ago, we just had our third baby. It's glorious and terrifying. But, you know, this, this, this birth was more easier one, you know. We always had our baby in the middle of the night. This one, baby came at 11 a.m. We actually went to bakery, pick up latte and some bread. And I was actually drinking my latte until the final contraction. But, but, you know, when the final contraction came, then the reality came upon me. That I was awakened to the reality when she began to groan. But I remember, you know, it's every time, it's the third time, but it's, you just don't get used to that pain. There's, you just, and, and my wife just said, I'm not going to do epidural, all natural. So as she begins to go through that contraction, you know, as a loving husband, there's just nothing you can do about that moment. Only thing you can do is just to just pray, God, please spare my wife. I mean, you're laughing because you haven't experienced it. It's coming your way. So pray for you. This is what Jesus meant when he was picking up the cross. Women wept for him and he said, no, weep for yourself. <laughs> but... 
But I remember as the final contraction came and she just began to groan. I mean, you can't just even put words to it. But as the baby came out, I mean, as, she, as my wife held the baby, I mean, she just instantly forgets, instantly forgets what just happened. I mean, the, the sheer amount, intensity of pain, you just can't forget what just happened. But Anna, as she held my daughter, instantly she's smiling. The great tribulation, when I say is unto lovesickness, I'm not trying to make the, the idea of great tribulation lightly. I'm not trying to take that idea lightly. But, but what I'm saying is, it's not meaningless. The contraction actually not only a sign of the birth, it actually helps the birth. You can't push the baby until the contraction comes. But what's the baby? That's the question I'm asking. I'm asking, what is the baby? The new heaven and earth. Uh, it's beyond that. There's something way bigger than new heaven and earth. Because there's a reality that penetrates all, through, all the way from Garden of Eden to New Jerusalem. And I'm going to convince that with my finger in the Bible. And I'm going to ask you, Lord, help me that I would, I would give birth in my time here at IHOP you. That you will conceive this reality in my life. That I will not just get the foreigner language and vocabulary. But this reality will be flesh and blood in my life. That, that you will come to an agreement with that. You know, when I, when I first became a leader here, one of the key principal lessons that Mike taught me about leadership, he said, you have to know the why behind the what. And everything that we have, IHOPU and GPR, the, all the policies that we have, we don't just make policies to make your life inconvenient. You know, sometimes people think that. They're like, well, why do I have to find the sub and, you know, do this or do that? Well, there are reasons why. Because this helped and strengthened the community. Well, I like to apply the same principle when I study the Bible. What's the why of great contraction? What Jesus referred to it, there's no tri tribulation like this one before, nor there will be any tribula tribulation after this tribulation. So I want to look at Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. Here it is. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intent of his heart. And in the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I want you to pay attention. The anger of who? The Lord. Not the anger of Antichrist. Not the anger of the hurl of Babylon. The anger of the Lamb of God. The anger of Jesus will not turn back until. I want you to pay attention to that word until. It means there is a... There is a precisely determined time. You see realities like this in Isaiah 10. Look at this. Isaiah 10. When the Lord has finished all his work. Whose work? His work. Finished his intention on Mount Zion. And the context is the Lord sending uh, the time of judgment in the city of Jerusalem. And the greater context is actually in the time of what we refer to as the, as the great tribulation. He will punish the arrogant heart of king of Assyria, the Antichrist. There's a figurative language for Antichrist. So pay attention. When the Lord has finished, until the Lord will not turn back. Well, the coronavirus kills so many people. No, there is an until. This is why... You want to play the blue sheet when you go up there in a microphone. When you're emotionally charged about Turkey, about pandemic, about Russia and Ukraine, you don't want to insert your opinions and idea over the sovereign and all-wise plan of God. I don't want to try to minimize the pain and agony of the, the, the tragedies that are happening. That's not what I'm saying. We have to weep with those who weep. Amen? We have to cry with those who cry and ask God for mercy. But don't insert your opinions of what should stop or what should continue. Because God has until. And you don't get to change that until. And that until will continue, not only based on a time frame, but he says, finished his work so that he can produce. Here it is. He has executed, one, execute. Number two, accomplished. The intent of his heart. 
the purposes of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. You will understand it. We, we quote this phrase a lot here at IHOP. In the latter days, God will raise up a people of understanding and they will know God's times and the f- plans for the end times. It includes that, but that's not the context of it. The it that the Lord said to Jeremiah is, you will understand that I have an intention. That you would understand that not only I have a plan for tribulation, not only I have a plan for 1260 days, the final three and a half years, and the 490 years of Daniel 9, that you will understand that after the 490 years have accomplished, that you will know that that I I had a greater purpose. That you will know that I was aiming for a specific fruit. That this contraction was supposed to birth a reality that I was after. All pervasive reality. And, and the reason why we have to know this, I want to ram- emphasize again, is because remember, just remember, Balaam, Gehazi, Judas, and Pharisees did not get deceived. They did not fall away for the lack of Bible knowledge. They did not walk away. You see, Mike was saying the past week, the greatest tragedy, tragedy will be the falling away. It will not be a physical pain or physical persecution. It will be walking away from your faith. So you got to ask the question, what's the root of deception? Well, actually, Dave talked about it, covetousness. But what's the root of covetousness? This is what Paul says. This is what Paul says to Timothy. Understand, Timothy. Understand this. What's this? In the last days, there will come times of difficulty because... People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Timothy, people will be deceived and buy into the mark of the beast and be deceived by Hall of Babylon. Not because they didn't attend the CBET and 150 chapters or one thing internship or four years of IHAPU. That's not the root of deception issue. The root of The root of deception, the heart of the matter is not in your head, but it's in your heart. What is your supreme treasure? What's satisfying you? Because if Jesus, this is not just a book that Dana Kendler writes. It needs to be a heart matter and you better answer this question before you leave here. If Jesus does not become a supreme treasure, a supreme treasure, you will be vulnerable to deception. You will follow your heart. This is why the Lord says, I'm not going to show you here. But Deuteronomy 13, the Lord tells Moses, when a prophet arises among you and does real signs and wonders, such as calling down fire from heaven, and when real fire really comes down in front of your eyes, not a live stream, not through web stream, not through YouTube trick, but with your eyes, when you see fire coming down from heaven, the Lord says, Do not listen to them. Do not follow them. Why? Because the Lord is testing you. Not Satan. Not the Antichrist. Not Holy Babylon. The Lord is testing you. What's that mean? The Lord is in charge of the cataclysmic rebellion. Now let that trouble you. what 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 I mean is not he has evil intentions. Okay, so have the end in mind. I'm keep emphasizing contraction is not a mistake, it's not an accident. This great tribulation does not happen by chance. God is intricately involved. And what I mean, you might say, well, Elijah, where is it in the Bible that God is intricately involved in charge of cataclysmic rebellion? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Revelation 17. For, because God has put it in their hearts. Who's they? Here is a ten confederate nations. Like the, just think of it as the, the, the beast, the antichrist kingdom. So they is the leaders of the antichrist kingdom. Because God has put, not Satan. Satan is involved. Wickedness of men are involved. Psalm 2, we know that. God has put it into their hearts to carry out whose purpose? Whose purpose? God caused them, the leadership, to submit to the Antichrist. 
So we need to wrestle. What's the purpose, God? What are you trying to produce? What, is, what are you orchestrating? I want to have, give you a proper perspective before I go further. In Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 30 is the, the terrifying passage where the Lord talks about the great tribulation. This is verse 6 and 7. But in Jeremiah 30, the Lord explains to Israel and gives them a pastoral perspective. Israel, I am involved in this contraction, but it's not to destroy you. It's not to annihilate you. It's not to replace you, but it's to save you. Here it is, Jeremiah 30. For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure. In another, in another translation, it says injustice. And I will by no means leave you unpunished. Because, do you see that word because? I'm not going to let you be unpunished. There's a reason why. Because your hurt is incurable and your wound is grievous. Do you see the Lord's perspective here? When you look at the intensity of the great tribulation, and if you're tempted to accuse God of being too cruel, too harsh, too severe, that testifies that you are underestimating the severity of sin. See, when 10 years old, when my, my daughter, not too long ago, was playing with a, with a straw and accidentally fell from a, from a chair and the straw went through her throat. And it, it made a hole. We, we went to Children's Mercy downtown, did a CT scan. We tried to put a need, you know, needle in her arm. She's just crying. I mean, and, we are, and, and, the, and the nurses are just shooting like four times just to put an epidural so that we can put a CT, a CT scan. We can do a CT scan. See, my daughter, I'm there. I'm right there. And she's, her arm's getting bloody because she's putting so much strength. The, the needle's not going through. And I'm just there looking at Haim. I said, Haim, daddy's here. Daddy's here. I know this is hurting. And I can't, I can't look at the blood. I'm just looking at her. I said, daddy's here. It's going to be okay. She doesn't get it. She's just screaming, crying. She's thinking that they, they're, they're there to hurt her. See, when the doctor comes in and do open her surgery to your body, you don't look at a surgeon and say, how dare you touch my body? You don't say... How dare you open, cut open my chest? You know what the surgeon is going to say to you? You have no idea of the condition that you're in. See, the great tribulation the Lord is explaining is that I am not too severe. I was too desperate to give you over to the lake of fire. I did not hand you over to hell. This is what Jesus meant in Matthew 5. If your eye causes you to sin, if your eyeballs get lost in a spectacle, the battle of spectacle in Instagram and Facebook, don't just linger there. Pluck it out. Get it off. Cut it off. If your hand causes you to sin, if your hand causes you to be tempted day and night to waste your time, to not redeem your time but to waste it, get rid of it. Because do not belittle sin. It will lead you to deception. And this is, how, this, is the, this is the reason why in Psalm 118, when Israel comes out of this great tribulation, this is, Psalm 118 is the famous prophecy that Jesus quotes. As he leaves Jerusalem, right? The leaders of Jerusalem rejected him. And, and he's leaving Jerusalem and he makes a prophecy, declaration, until you say with your own mouth, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You're not going to see me again. He's quoting Psalm 118, but he's quoting not just that phrase. He's quoting the whole passage. And Psalm 118, Israel is actually coming out of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation. And it's a song of praise. And what's striking is it's a song of thanksgiving. But this is how she interprets. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but has not given me over to death. The Lord's measure of surgery was painful. Yes, it was. But it was so that he will not hand me over to the lake of fire. Therefore, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and for his staff as love endures forever. I, think, I, I believe the Lord is going to raise up a body of students in this house prophetic messengers 
who will not only reluctantly agree with his leadership, but from the depth of partnership with him, that you will begin to sing and declare of his good leadership, goodness, and his steadfast love in the midst of cataclysmic events. Lord, we know your leadership, your head is as fine as wool, is as fine as gold, is as wide as wool. We know your leadership is perfect. Guard your soul, almighty one, for the sake of truth, humility, and justice. You are the faithful witness. Your name is the faithful and the true. I'm asking the Lord to give you that invitation for you to say, yes, Lord. I want to be a burning one who understands, but not only that, to produce. So what's the purpose, Elijah? What is the purpose? So this is where we come to Jeremiah 30. Coming back to Jeremiah 30, I just quoted Jeremiah 30, uh, 11 and 12, but the whole context of Jeremiah 30 and 31 and 32, I want to encourage you to read it later. In Jeremiah 30, he's going to, what, what Jeremiah does, what the Lord does, is he's going to reiterate Jeremiah 23, what we just read. We, it says that the anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intentions and the purpose of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand perfectly. But what's, what's interesting in Jeremiah 30 is, in Jeremiah 30, he not only say God has a purpose, he actually specifies what that purpose is. I want you to pay attention. What is that purpose? Verse 22. I want you to pay attention that how Jeremiah brackets this, this prophecy, you will understand God's purpose with this phrase. You shall be my people. And I will be your God. Behold, the fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand this. And just in case we do casual Bible reading of like, okay, okay. No, the Lord goes, no, no, no. You will understand this. In case you miss what this is, the Lord says it again. There, there should be no chapter break here. It's in the same context. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of Israel, and they shall be my people. I will be your God, and you shall be my treasured possession. Abraham, Abraham, I will give you the land. I'm going to give you the seed as many as the sand of the, of the, of the ocean, of the sea, of the beach, then I will give you a great name among, among the nations, and I'm going to cause the Messiah to come forth out of your lineage. But Abraham, I want you to know before you receive any of the promises, I want you to know this reality, that I'm going to, per, I'm going to, I'm going to cut, through, cut through all the 4,000 years of your descendants with this reality that I am your exceeding great reward. Abraham, know that I'm not wishing for that. I'm going to accomplish that vision. And until you understand, until you come to the reality of I am your exceeding supreme treasure, whom am I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My strength and my flesh may fail, but Lord, you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And, on, uh, and just in case you... You underestimate their reality. I'm going to mobilize a whole tribe named Levite. And when they enter into the promised land, I'm not going to give them the land. Because their life will be a living testimony. The Lord is my portion forever. And he's going to cut through this reality. But time and time again, Israel begins to forget. This is where we get to the chapter of Hosea 1. Where the Lord says, go tell them, lo ami. That they are not my people anymore. And I am not their God. But then chapter 2. The Lord cannot contain his recoiling mercy. I call it recoiling. He says my bowel recoils with mercy as I think about you. How can I give you up like Zeboim? How can I forget about you and bring complete destruction like Sodom and Gomorrah? I, I think about you still, and my heart earnestly longs after you. Therefore, I will have mercy upon you. And the Lord says, the mountains may depart, the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love and my covenant will be with you. 
And the Lord begins to prophesy over and over again. But in Hosea 2, the Lord says, In that day, I will allure you in the wilderness. And you will come to realization that I am not just your master, but I am your husband. But don't get too familiar with the language of husband. Don't get too familiar with the theology of the bridegroom God. I want the reality. And the Lord says, I will betroth you to myself forever. And then he ends that passage with, and you will say to me, you are my God. And I will say to you, you are my people. But the context of Jeremiah is that Israel does not get that. That's the tragedy. The tragedy is after time and time again of judgment and mercy and judgment and mercy, all the captivities did not communicate the message. And they thought we got enough, we, got, we had enough judgment, we had enough captivities. I think it's time. 1948, we're established. I think the nations are coming to us. I think this is the millennial kingdom. And the Lord goes, did I not tell you that the Lord will not turn back? Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah 10, Isaiah 9, the Lord says, the hand of the Lord is stretched out still and he will not turn back until he not only executes but accomplishes. So he goes in Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13 is one of the most terrifying passages in the Bible. But it's also one of the most wonderful and most comforting passages in the whole Bible. The reason is, the, ver the, 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 the prophecy of Zechariah does not end with verse 8, but it ends with verse 9. And it shall come to pass in all the land that the two-thirds, it shall be cut off and die. And the Lord is talking about in the time of great tribulation, the two-thirds of the population of the Jewish people will be cut. We need to weep over this. We need to ask God, Lord, give us an unceasing anguish like you gave Paul the apostle. That we will not just have a head knowledge and walking around and just talking about Jacob's trouble, but that we will groan in our privacy of our lives. And in the secret place of our life, that we would have no words but groan. Have mercy, O oh God. But I want you to catch this. Verse 9, I will bring the one-third through the fire and refine them as silver is refined. And they will call upon my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. After the, the cutting of two-thirds and the refining of one-third, after this refining fire, What's the final picture? What's the end result that the Lord is looking for? I will be your treasure possession. And the treasure possession is not my language. It's the very language that he uses. Here in Malachi chapter 3. Here it is in Malachi 3. They will be mine, says Yahweh. Now context of Malachi is actually in context of house of prayer. They just rebuilt the house of prayer the Lord comes with a surprising message. I did not ask of you for sacrifices and burnt offerings. Is there anyone who shut the door of the temple? So he comes with a seemingly severe message, but he's not. What he's doing is, did not, did not, not communicate to you that it's not okay that you just go activity after activity and activity. My point to Bob Jones wasn't just build a 24 intercession prayer room where they cry out and scream loud what I ask of you is the spirit of the tabernacle of David the reality that David touched I want a perpetual incessant reality of going on and on and on so the Lord says by the time to Malachi 3 in chapter 2 he says what priests ought to do and what they failed and then in chapter 3 he says there's coming a day of the Lord for those who rejoice for thinking that for the day of the Lord will be your salvation. No, no, no. Like just like John the Baptist said, no, the Lord, the Lord requires the fruit of repentance. And that day will be a day of judgment if you don't repent. But before that day, he's going to send a messenger. He's going to raise up a community to produce forerunner messengers, voice in the wilderness. But not just for voice, for voice sake, to produce what reality? What is he trying to produce through the messenger? And this is what he says. 
they shall be and will be mine on the day that I am acting, on the day that I arise, on the day of the Lord. This is what I'm after in my treasured possession. And this is where we come to Song of Solomon. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. The, the whole journey of Song of Solomon, of the bride thinking and knowing, okay, you, I am your beloved, but first you need to be my beloved first, right? This is in chapter 2. And as the Lord begins to unveil the ravished heart of the bridegroom, as the Lord begins to unveil, not with the message that you're not doing enough, that's not the primary message of Song of Solomon. And this is why I said, though it seems heavy, I am coming with a heart and, the, and prayer asking the Lord, Lord, would you cause the ravished heart of the bridegroom that, that you will break familiarity off of our mouth and off of our ears. The language of lovesickness that, that we won't just be so familiar, look, that, but, that we would actually be touched and be tenderized. That there will actually be a circumcision of the heart. That you would actually take the stony heart and give us a heart of a flesh. And just like the Lord says in Jeremiah 24 verse 7, in that day I will give you a heart to know me. And that you will return to me with your whole heart and I will be your God and you shall be my people. And the Lord says, I will take that stony heart. And not only that, Ezekiel, I, wanna, I want you to go to the valley of dry bones. What do you see, Ezekiel? Dry bones. No, 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 no. What do, what do I see, Ezekiel? And the Lord says, begin to prophesy. As, and as Ezekiel begins to prophesy, the Lord says, I'm gonna, uh, there's a coming a day. I'm going to open up the grave of generation Z and generation Alpha. And I'm going to breed upon them. And I'm going to save them out of all of their compromise, all of their backsliding, all of their lukewarmness. See, think about it. 1983 to 2023. This is the 40-year mark. And we're asking God for to break the drought and send the rain. The Lord gave us that 21 days fast. At the end of that fast, the Lord said there's a set time, sovereign time. And this drought is going to continue for, for a season of time. But God will not be a single minute late. He's going to break, break the drought and send the rain. But guess what? What was the breaking of the drought? Because the same year in November, Bob Jones says to Mike, the message is, is either you're going to get cut up to the throne room or the message is going to come directly from the throne room. And, and, and as the day came, as he's reading this book of placebo, the Lord begins to speak to Mike, there's a coming a day that I'm going to break the spirit of lukewarmness. That's the drought. The spirit of complacency. So the Lord says to Ezekiel, I'm going to open up grave. And I'm going to breed. I'm going to resurrect. I'm not just going to heal. I'm going to resurrect, put new vein to new heart, to new mind. And I'm going to produce this reality. You shall know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. I will save them from all the backslidings, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Then, I want you to catch the word then. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. This is my prayer. Lord, would you do a such work in Kansas City that you would produce a reality to such degree that the church, that the people of this city and, the, and, and, the, and our generation will know and will actually confess God sanctifies his church. This is a miracle that the world will actually say God sanctifies, he's committed to the church. God's not only going to do a miracle upon our heart to love the church. He's going to do a miracle in our hearts to be consumed with lovesickness to such a degree that the world would actually testify God is committed to his church. God who began a good work will bring it to completion. And he sanctifies his bride. When? When the reality of I am my beloved, my beloved is mine, not only becomes a book, not only becomes Mike Bickle's sermon, but becomes a reality of this student body. I believe that's why you're here. 
See, when Israel fails to catch this vision after 4,000 years, I mean, the Lord's going to accomplish it no matter what. Revelation 21, behold, the tabernacle of God, what David saw is now here. Heaven finally comes to the earth. And what's the end result? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with us, that he will be our God, and we will be his people. That's the final end, climax of the Bible. The Lord's going to do it, but I believe the Lord's looking for voices. Friends of the bridegroom, those weak among men. I, I love this passage. If you didn't hear anything of my sermon, walk away with this one promise. Zechariah 12. In that day, the weak among men will be like David. The weak among you, you can be like David. You can love Jesus like David did. The Lord is going to give you courage and boldness. But think about it. When Israel fails to catch the vision, this is where our story comes in, right? The story of Ruth. I'm not going to develop that story, but think about it. Out of all the confession that she could make, she comes from the lineage of Moab. If you, if you connect later with the story of Numbers 22 to 24, the story of Moab is a premier example of Harley Babylon, Right? This false prophet, Balaam, wants to curse Israel, and he can't curse. So what he does, he sends the Moabite prostitutes to the camp of Israel. And as the Moabite prostitutes go into the tent of Israel, the, the, the judgment of God breaks out, and the, and the tens and thousands of Jews get struck dead. But it says, the, the, the writer of Ruth, he says, here was a woman who came from the lineage of the Moabite prostitution that caused Israel's curse and judgment. And the Lord brings this woman and makes a pledge even unto death. And she, out of her mouth comes what reality? Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. When the 4,000 of years of Israel did not catch this vision, God's going to raise some young men and women as weak as David was in Bethlehem, from China, from Korea, from Brazil, from wherever you came from, and he's going to cause you to conceive this message, and he's going to cause you to birth this reality in your generation. So my invitation, I'm going to pray now. This is my invitation. The point of my message, just to remind you again, there is a reality of persecution coming. It's only a matter of time. The reality of Iran comes home. But my point isn't to put a heavy yoke upon you. My point isn't you better do better because persecution is coming at your door. That's not my point. The point is we are going to be a people who understand not only that reality is coming, but the purpose of that reality. But not only are we going to understand that, we're going to say in our weak yes, in the place of our weakness, we want to come before him. See, this is the invitation to the church of Laodicea. You might think when Jesus said to Laodicea, I wish, rather whether, I wish that you would rather be cold or hot. I will spit you out. I will vomit you out of, out of me if you're lukewarm. It sounds harsh, but that's not what Jesus was, that's not his point. His point is, church of Laodicea, I am too fiercely jealous for wholehearted love. Like using Dana Kinley's language. Like if you ever lack a language, go read Dana Kinley's book. And then you will know what you're looking for. You know, you know what to pray for. I love what she said in her, in her book, First Love. She said something along the line. Jesus refused to receive anything but fullness. That's troubling. You, you realize that's what's causing the great tribulation. That he refuses to receive anything but fullness. That's what's causing 6,000 years. That's what's causing 4,000 years and 2,000 years of gap. He's waiting for voluntary. He's not going to force it. He's waiting for voluntary like 24 elders that the people of God will have such a high vision of his supreme worth that we will voluntarily cast all of our lives and say, you are a portion forever. And he's waiting for that response from a whole generation. But here's, here's the truth. Remember, my point is, and you better do better to produce love. That's not my point. My point is, 
God has done such, such work in your life that he brought you all the way here and he gave you this kind of mentors and professors. And my point is, hey, do you realize that he just allures you? That he's, he's bringing you already. He's already began this work in your life. And I'm, what I'm asking you, realign. Say yes again. Say yes to the exceeding greatness of his power. This is why we need the revelation. I said, Lord, I don't think I can ever be like Dave. Like this is how I felt. You know, the whole four years of IHOP use as a student, every time Dave will talk, he just sounds smart. And I was just saying, maybe it's just people from the East Coast are just smart and just talk fast. But, but I, you know, and, 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 and there was, you know, and, and, you know, these guys were always saying, but you guys will be the foreigner messengers and the voice. And I always felt like, well, I can't barely even pray in English. I don't even, I don't even know what tribulation word means. I have to look for a dictionary when everybody's, you know, already moving on. But I remember I said, I, this is what I said. I said, Lord, if I have to wake up at 3 a.m. to do double I, my, my brain is not that smart. My capacity is low. But I'm going to do what you have given me. I'm going to turn, begin to turn things down. I'm going to begin to say no to good opportunities. And I'm going to begin to choose to redeem my time. If I have to go triple the walk of the rest of the student body, Lord, would you just give me, I don't need, even need to be like Dave. Would you just give me that clarity and that conviction and that, that yearning and longing? Oh, God, I want that reality in my life. And I began to cry out. I said, God, I will give you my time, my commitment. Come and set it on fire with your grace. I would, I would dare not to underestimate the power of your grace. And this is, man, this is the Lord's invitation to the church of Laodicea. The Lord says, come, whoever thirsts. People in this room right now, you're thirsting. You're like, Lord, I don't know if I have it, but I thirst for this reality. I thirst for this lovesickness. I thirst and I hunger for this clarity. The Lord says, come, Isaiah 55. Come, whoever thirsts. Come, whoever hunger. Why do you satisfy your time? Why do you set your gaze with things that cannot satisfy you? Come, I will give you a superior pleasure. Come like Mary, sit at my feet. That's all you got to do. And I will do a great work in you that only grace of God can accomplish. And as he begins to convince, and he, this is what he says to Israel. My ways are not like your ways. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. But you know what the context of that word is? The context of that word is not. You were wishing to go this way for your career and that God put you here. That's not what he's talking about. The context of my thoughts are not like you. I don't think like you. I don't feel like you. I don't view things like you. The context is whoever the sinner come. This is, this is verse, verse 7 and 8. And, and that, that I may have mercy abundantly. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. I don't view you like the way you view yourself. My feeling, my emotions are not like the way you are. Whoever thought, come. I will match your weak guess with the exceeding immeasurable power of my grace. And watch what happens. If you have a hunger, come. This is my invitation. I want to have a group, time a group of small group to pray together. But I want to read you this quote. And I, wanna, I want us to break into a small group that we pray for one another. This is from Madame Guion. And Madame Guion, if you've never heard of her, maybe borrow her book from Dave and Dana. And just read, read her just depth of intimacy with Jesus. But this is what she says. You may think you're the one person most incapable, the one farthest from a deep experience with the Lord. But in fact, the Lord has especially chosen you. You are the one most suited to know him well. Some of you may feel that you are very slow, like me, like those of you watching online. And some of you may feel that you are poor understanding and that you are very unspiritual, that you don't have the zeal like Jacob Pilch or Nathan Steele. Maybe you feel that way. Dear reader, there is nothing easier, I'm right here, there's nothing easier to obtain 
than the enjoyment of Jesus Christ. There's nothing easier than to come to Him. And what, what does that mean? There's nothing easier than to be lovesick. Why? Because He earnestly longs for you more than yourself. He's gripped to lay hold of you is stronger than your desperation to lay hold of him we gotta remember the cross we did not choose him he came after us and she concludes your lord is more present to you than you are to yourself furthermore his desire to give himself to you is greater than your desire to lay hold of him worship to come up i want you to stand